Hi, my name is Suchi Raman, and um, I'm here on behalf of Plexi. Uh, we've been working on open daylight um, at Plexi, uh, doing a couple of different things, and uh, one of our main contributions in this first release, the hydrogen release, was um, something that we call the Affinity API. And um, I'm going to talk more about that today. So that's the, the, that's the primary topic of um, today's presentation. A quick word of introduction about Plexi. Uh, Plexi is a uh, startup. We're headquartered in uh, the New England area. And uh, we have a um, line of products that's uh, SDN, uh, you know, uh, Ethernet SDN. Uh, we ship, uh, we, we build uh, Ethernet switches, and we have a, you know, a custom fabric uh, that's uh, primarily targeted toward uh, high performance uh, data center applications. And we have an SDN controller. Uh, we call that the central controller, C3. And we're looking at open daylight as the sort of the open standard um, that will control all kinds of networks, including a Plexi network. OK, so with that introduction, um, here's a quick outline of uh, what we'll cover today. Um, I'm going to talk about what this Affinity API is. It's an invention that you know, uh, we're very proud of at Plexi. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what it is and, and why it is, and um, share with you some examples of how we see the Affinity API being used and um, uh, go over some of the details of the Affinity API. So we think of this abstraction in, in terms of some you know, objects in the API, and so I'll cover those. Um, I'll also talk about what we do with this Affinity API. And uh, that is the topic of what we call the fitting engine. And I'll talk about a very, very rudimentary fitting engine framework that we've put in Open Daylight. And um, uh, I'll go over how we use that. And, um, you know, there are lots of important use cases for Affinity API and the fitting engine, but I'll talk primarily about two of them that um, have been, you know, uh, relatively uh, quick to prototype and, and implement with an open daylight and have generally been, um, you know, popular use cases. So, so we'll go over a couple of use cases um, and the example behind those. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about future. So, you know, we, we, we are hyper-focused on, on SDN today as being sort of the centralized method of controlling um, the network. And I'll talk a little bit about where we think we should take this over the next couple of releases. So we'll go from SDN, you know, to the cloud, um, sort of going beyond just the network and, you know, talking about um, other uh, aspects of the overall data center. Okay, so what is this thing that we call the Affinity API? Well, quite simply, it's, it's where the application meets the network. Um, and it's the API by which an application can be more formally described to the network controller in all aspects of the application, its workload, its communication patterns, um, what kinds of paths it requires, and so on. And uh, the abstraction that we've come up with has really sort of two parts. Uh, the first one describes the application topology. So, you know, where are the communicating endpoints of the application? Um, what are the identifiers, you know, uh, for, these, for these endpoints? So, if you're talking about a uh, web server farm or a uh, MapReduce cluster, um, you know, you identify that to the network controller by enumerating its IP addresses or, or layer two identifiers. Uh, in a virtualized world, you know, where things are hosted on virtual, uh, virtual machines, um, we, we believe that the API can actually be extended. Um, so in the near future, we will have uh, vNICs or virtual host identifiers as valid IDs for application endpoints. Um, so pr basically, we want to, we want to capture um, the identifiers for these application endpoints within your app. And an affinity link is essentially a bundle of flows um, that goes from one you know, source group to a destination group. And this is you know, a pattern we chose because it, it's a very commonly occurring pattern in, in a lot of different apps. If you look at these mega you know, web clusters where you have three tiers, you have a web farm that's talking to an app <coughs> server farm, 
um, which is backed by a large database cluster, you know, you have these, these groups of endpoints that can be quite nicely expressed using this abstraction. Same holds for things like MapReduce applications, where you might have a cluster of uh, compute nodes that are busy doing mapping, and then others that are busy doing reduction. And the important network traffic is you know, when data is exchanged from mappers to reducers and vice versa. The important thing to notice here is that these endpoints can be anywhere in the network. And so um, you, know, you can think of this in a uh, virtualized data center context where um, you know, there's no locality. They can span racks. They can span, you know, multiple data centers. Um, essentially, the API and the implementation must be flexible enough to support, um, you know, this, this anywhere uh, notion of endpoints. Okay. So I talked a little bit about affinity links. What's important about those is um, they represent the network path from the source to the destination. And what we, what as a controller, what we're primarily interested in knowing about the application is what sort of path you know must the application traverse. Um, an example is that you know it's a um, latency sensitive application, and so you want to provision that along the lowest hop count path or the shortest path. Or it's a bandwidth intensive application, so I don't mind sacrificing the number of hops, but you know, I do need a minimum of 10 gigabit per second throughput between communicating endpoints. And so um, the most common, you know, attributes, path attributes are hop count and, and bandwidth. Uh, but there are also others that are typical in these cloud-like environments. And so when you talk about, you know, multiple applications sharing a common infrastructure, sometimes it becomes important to isolate traffic of one, you know, application or tenant or customer from another application or tenant. And so isolation is, is actually one of the um, uh, more interesting path attributes that uh, this Affinity API supports. Another characteristic is whether your traffic flow is unidirectional or bidirectional. Um, a lot of applications are asymmetric in the way that they transfer data. And so if you want to optimize paths, specifying you know, which direction um, your data is flowing is very useful to the controller so that it can then go off and, and provision uh, accordingly. So what do we do with all of this information? So we get all of this, you know, essentially affinity config information, uh, groups, endpoints, nodes, links, and um, we have a uh, centralized affinity engine that runs in the controller that, uh, you know, compiles all of these uh, and provisions, you know, routes and paths on the network. So that's the essential you know, job of what we call the affinity engine or the fitting engine. So I want to motivate this using a few examples. These are actually fairly real world examples that we come across at Plexi. Um, and uh, the, the first one there is a um, storage use case. So here you have compute nodes that are, that have mounted, you know, block storage volumes from uh, storage servers. And because this traffic is uh, you know, tends to be uh, throughput sensitive. We want to provision high throughput paths between these compute cluster nodes and the storage nodes. So that's a classic example uh, where you've separated the storage cluster from, from your compute cluster. Um, another cloud example is the um, isolation use case I talked about. So you have two different applications that are both sharing common infrastructure, and you want them to have um, you know, separate uh, network paths uh, to, you know, shared resources. Uh, so that's the case where you would, you know, request a, a, an isolation group for one and an isolation group for another. Um, a similar example is the entire web app. I already talked briefly about that. So why do we care about this Affinity API? Um, I think it's important to observe that a lot of Standardization effort around SDN has started occurring, uh, but it's, it's very much focused on the protocols at a device level. And um, those are extremely important, but, but they don't solve this particular problem of, of having application workloads reflected into the network controller um, and then optimized. So things like OpenFlow, um, NetConf, uh, SNMP, you know, are all device specific, and uh, they don't uh, attempt to describe application needs to, to the controller. 
Um, so they're, neither are they global, so they don't talk about the network as a whole, and they don't talk about um, applications for sure. So that is the void that um, we are trying to fill with this API, and it's actually ideally suited to open daylight because the job of open daylight as a centralized network controller is to sort of you know, abstract the overall network as a single entity to uh, upstream consumers. And so this is, we think, actually a fairly important part of the northbound API. Um, and we, we think that large portions of the northbound API can actually be covered with this uh, abstraction. So you know, um, as one of my colleagues likes to put it, it's, it's sort of the networking lingua franca, uh, especially in this controller-driven SDN world. And, um, we want to make this, in fact, the, 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 um, you know, the dominant way in which app, apps talk to the network controller. And it's, at, it's important to, to notice that um, it's, it's, it's a common language, but it's also uh, agnostic to the platform underneath. So your network could be an open flow network. It could be a vendor proprietary you know, custom fabric. Um, it could be a layer three you know, IP network, IP SDN. And affinities apply equally well to all of these kinds of SDNs. And I'll show you how in just a couple of minutes. So I talked a little bit about isolation and hop count and bandwidth. Those are, those are uh, very much sort of routing oriented. Um, there are these important exception cases to normal routing. And um, uh, an example is you, know, you have flows that belong to a certain application affinity link. And you want to route these through a waypoint server. Um, I think people have variously called it uh, service chaining or, or waypoint routing, uh, where essentially you've placed constraints on the route, and you're saying that the route must go through these other appliances or, or network service functions. Um, and these service functions might be hardware appliances attached to you know, physical ports on a switch, uh, but also they might be uh, you know, virtual appliances that are, that are packaged and running as, as VMs alongside your compute cluster. And so it becomes important to support these kinds of exception cases where um, the administrator might define affinities, let's say, uh, for traffic that matches a certain you know, signature for a certain affinity group and link, the traffic must traverse through this, this special path and not just take the default route. So that supports a bunch of security-like uh, applications, so data center security applications where you know, I, I want to force all traffic through a certain path. Um, it also supports certain important monitoring applications. So um, I, I can now say um, tap this traffic you know, to a certain uh, server, basically replicate it in addition to its original path, provide a copy of the data you know, to this uh, other endpoint, which can then you know, monitor it and analyze it and do uh, other kinds of processing. So we view all of these as being within the umbrella of affinity attributes. And um, the richer this set of attributes can be, the more kinds of applications we can support on this universal API. Um, this actually, it, while, while, it, while it supports a lot of good applications, um, it also introduces this slight complexity because now we have to take into account so yeah, go ahead. Is the set of attributes dynamic such that clients or people developing on top of Affinity can add new uh, Affinity attributes to that as well as perhaps logic rules into the fitting engine? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I'd say it, it could be. Today it isn't really that extensible. Um, but yeah, we would like it to be extensible. Um, do you have particular use cases in mind that don't fall into this set of categories, but might need you know, sort of user-defined extensions. Particularly, I think, figure out routing, best path, um, take into account multiple layers, and things like that. Um, you could take in priority, customer, um, various. I don't know. I think there's some use cases there. I, I'm just wondering if we, as developers on top of Affinity, as on top of Daylight, have to always go back to the source code to add these, or they can be augmented on in you know, the runtime. Yep. Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, question, that uh, making this more extensible. Um, certainly, you know, uh, uh, there are important extensions, such as tenancy and, and you know, other kinds of header properties that we would like to incorporate. Um, uh, I, I think the short answer is that 
it, it, it isn't currently extensible, but I think could, could possibly make an interesting discussion. So, um, so the question was, who is responsible for putting in all this affinity configuration? And the answer is, uh, it's an API, and so we can invoke it either programmatically, so it can come in from another application or, or another, you know, orchestration framework. Um, but all the same, you know, it can, it, you know, it, a lot of people use it, you know, through the UI today, for example, which is a manual process of, you know, defining affinities. Um, but uh, because it's all hidden behind this REST API, um, it, it's completely programmatic and, and you know, can support both usage modes. So that the controller will handle that. So the Affinity Engine, you know, is going to listen to um, notifications from things like host tracker, from the topology manager, from the routing service, and um, actually update state um, responding to that. Um, that, that. That we believe is sort of an internal function that must happen dynamically refreshed. Um, Yeah, so it's, it's very analogous to OpenFlow in that sense, right? Because OpenFlow says, I'm going to put in all these rules, but I get back stats, you know, matching those rules. And, and we do have a preliminary um, analytics API. I'll talk a little bit about that much later. Um, and the role of the analytics API is today primarily reporting based. So if I have configured an affinity link, you know, which sort of from the application perspective, it represents a bundle of traffic. I can read back from the controller, you know, all the things that happened on that affinity link. So I can get per protocol stats, per host stats, um, so on. Interesting. So the comment was that it, it would be useful to have stats uh, async mode of, of stats gathering. Um, I, I think that's actually a good topic for, for a deep dive. Let, let, let's hold that for a little while longer because I do have something interesting to say at the end on that. Um, so, so, so today's implementation is not is not that dynamic. Um, it does react to state changes. So, if there is you know a link failure, or if um, hosts come and go, uh, or if a host migrates, uh, you know that that sort of thing will be uh, uh, refreshed. But you know if um, uh, a flow exceeds a certain rate, and you want a certain action. Um, that's still very much orchestrated from the northbound API calls. It isn't something that you know you place as an active program inside the controller. Um, I think that was that was the sort of you know more advanced um, sort of detection that um, both of you were alluding to. Okay. Um, the thing I want to mention about multiple attributes is that it, it introduces some complexity in the routing service. So any network forwarding service must take these things into account. And so uh, if you have waypoint routes, um, waypoints as a constraint on default forwarding, then obviously you know, the kinds of routes that you return back must, must you know, include those uh, on route destinations. Um, same thing for global tap. Uh, global tap is special because um, you know, what you're saying in global tap is that you want traffic 
uh, originating from a certain source to go not just to its destination, um, but also to this additional um, endpoint. And so you have to, the, the routing engine has to be capable uh, of computing a loop-free uh, set of paths in that, in that situation. So um, calls for some additional intelligence in the routing service, which uh, is not available, you know, in, in, a, in at least in the standard open daylight uh, routing implementation. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the API, the objects in the API. Um, we went over what the fitting engine does. Um, for those that, of you that are interested in the internals, you know, here's a little bit of a, of a deep dive into what is inside the fitting engine and how we've sort of hooked it all together inside Open Daylight. Um, I want to point out that one of the innovations at Plexi is actually a highly dynamic, traffic-aware fitting engine. And one of the things that we've tried to do here in Open Daylight is to provide a framework um, that will accommodate you know, any flavor of sort of fitting algorithm. And so um, this isn't the highly dynamic traffic engineer uh, fitting engine. All it is is a sort of a very rudimentary graph-based, uh, you know, it, it's a path. Uh, it, it basically places paths in response to these affinity configurations. So it's, it's a... Uh, it's a skeleton of, of the um, sort of the, the, the ideal or the more full-featured fitting engine. So what this fitting engine does is to take a snapshot of the affinity configuration from the metadata repository. So um, the idea is that somebody, either a program or a human being, is adding all this affinity configuration to the metadata, and the fitting engine periodically you know, takes a snapshot of it and then computes um, forwarding state in the network. And the forwarding state takes this you know, form where um, there's a group of flows because our endpoints, you know, we typically see these things in large aggregates. Uh, we're you know, talking about large data center applications that are generally deployed in big, you know, big clusters and groups. And so there's a flow group um, and then the associated paths uh, for, those fl for the flow group. And note that uh, affinity paths are sort of at a higher preference than your default forwarding. So you might have default forwarding that's either a learning-based fabric or um, it might be, uh, you know, simple forwarding. If, if people are familiar with um, the layer three simple forwarding implementation, um, which basically places host routes. And so what's neat is that affinity paths coexist with these other forms of forwarding service within the, uh, within the fabric. And so um, th these appear at a, at a higher priority um, than the uh, default forwarding. What we have today is, um, you know, we like to think of it as a flat layer two domain. Um, so there's no hierarchies and there's, there's uh, no routing per se. It's, it's just, you know, a flat domain. Um, but, but we do think that um, an important extension is to support other kinds of SDNs, in particular overlay SDNs like Dove, um, as well as uh, you know, multi-tenant SDNs like, like um, BTN and, uh, and so on. So I think one of the things we're looking forward to is, is sort of post-hydrogen, uh, trying to understand what it means to have affinities in a world with um, you know, tunnels established between hypervisor endpoints. And I think there are some early ideas floating around, but uh, uh, certainly something that needs to be fleshed out. So here's a picture of all the players within the uh, Open Daylight controller. And this is a subset of the things that we rely on. Um, host tracker is this you know, host database that tracks where hosts are attached within the network. Um, routing is, of course, the, you know, the, the path calculation engine within Open Daylight. A forwarding rules manager is the one that ultimately actually you know, maintains the database of flows and then programs them and, and removes them um, as, as time goes. Um, so an important function of the Affinity Engine is uh, to use the centralized routing service to compute paths and then to you know, invoke the forwarding rules manager to actually place the flows within the network. Um, so if you think about it, it's sort of, you know, a, a, an additional service on top of all of these other network service functions. And uh, its implementation is fairly network specific. So if you're operating in an open flow SDN, uh, 
you know, your affinity engine is going to do things in a certain specific way. But you might also imagine, you know, how this might look in a Plexi SDN where uh, the same API can be rendered in, in different ways. Um, okay. What's interesting for us uh, is uh, if you fast forward a little bit, you know, once we have all these different types of network under open daylight control, um, the, op the, the Affinity API can be sort of the, the single way in which we do all of these, you know, application um, network control operations. And so you would imagine, you know, uh, an administrator or an external application programming through the same API, uh, but there is, you know, the Affinity engine that's uh, internally reading that config, but then individually controlling the different segments. Uh, so whether it's an open flow segment of the network versus uh, Plexi ring or, uh, you know, a Dove VTN uh, edge network. And so um, that's where this becomes very powerful. The application no longer needs to know the internal details of each of those networks and, you know, write code that, that um, handles all of that. It can just go through this higher layer abstraction and uh, remain completely unaware of what's going on underneath. So some use cases here are, um, you know, when you combine a Dove VTN network with a Plexi ring, um, you know, Dove is establishing uh, overlay tunnels, and one of the important functions we think we can provide here is um, how to steer this overlay traffic along particular paths. And so what we did in a, um, you know, native layer two SDN, we can then sort of adapt for a tunnel-oriented overlay SDN. I'll go briefly over some use cases. Um, one of our primary focuses at, at uh, Plexi has been the data center. And so we've tried to sort of come up with use cases that are relevant in, in large data centers and virtualized clouds. Um, I think service providers uh, have, you know, probably an equally interesting and large set of use cases. Um, I, I think for the time being, we're going to focus on, on um, the data center. Uh, so, an important aspect, and I think this answers one of the questions that came up earlier, is uh, we have to support all kinds of applications, right? Applications that are, um, you know, it might be a mega data center running web search or, you know, other kinds of data processing, and there needs to be uh, fine-grained network control for that application. That we think of as an end-user application. Um, the other kinds of applications are network service applications or network management applications where we're monitoring the network or we have specific policies that require traffic to be diverted along a certain path uh, or security applications on this open daylight controller. And um, in all of these cases, there is, of course, the option of doing manual configuration from the UI or, or the API. Um, but what makes this all really interesting, I think, is uh, the ability to automate affinity configuration. And this is, I think, a grand challenge um, in, in more ways than one, because automating affinity configuration requires some network intelligence that, um, you know, can actually identify, you know, what these flows are that require special treatment. Um, so aside from the, the administrative, you know, configuration aspects, um, doing things like, um, you know, finding large flows, finding, um, you know, uh, uh, anomalous flows, uh, in order to, you know, divert them to, to a security appliance. Those kinds of activities require a deeper level of sort of network intelligence that I think sort of opens the door toward, to, to um, more detailed analytics. Yeah, so, so it's definitely a very separate problem. Um, it, it is in some sense a uh, prerequisite to use this in an automated, uh, automated fashion. Um, so mining network data for elephant flows might very well happen in you know, a different location. It might not even happen within the controller. 
Um, uh, but controller is definitely an interesting place to, to, to you know, get enough visibility into, into data to do that. Um, uh, we don't view that portion as part of the Affinity API. We, we actually think of that as, as you know, something separate. And in fact, um, we, we, it's, it's not yet clear to us, at least, how, how that would be presented in the form of an API. Uh, but there is definitely an interesting uh, use case around mining uh, or, or querying the controller for, um, you know, elephant flows or, um, you know, high data rate flows, long-lived large flows, things like that. Okay. Um, so I'll talk briefly about what we do have today as the analytics API. So today's analytics API is primarily geared around reporting. And so we can report out uh, within an affinity context and we can say, um, here are all the things that uh, happened historically on this affinity link. And that is very useful, uh, especially if you're interested in knowing how an application is performing. You know, it's, it's useful to configure its application topology and then query the controller for uh, information on its performance. And uh, the implementation today is essentially to, to take raw open flow stats, but to, um, you know, construct different views on it. And so what open flow stats give you is just, you know, raw statistics for every rule in the forwarding table. And what the user is interested in is things like show me everything between a particular host pair or show me everything between particular affinity groups. And those are essentially, um, you know, it's post-processing of raw OF stats that we do today in order to present this as, um, as higher layer application information. The more uh, difficult problem, of course, is, is you know, uh, discovering the anomalous flows. And, and there's some prior art here, and there's some interesting heuristics. Um, I won't go into a lot of the details now, but, you know, um, this, is, this is definitely an interesting uh, discussion area. So the way this would work is that, um, suppose you had a network that looks something like this. This is actually a real mini-net topology. Um, you have the control in the middle, and, um, you know, we have a s simple application today that's written as a Python script um, whose role it is to detect and steer uh, large flows from one location toward a, a scrubbing device or a, or a uh, security appliance. And the switches are S1, S2, S3, and the hosts are you know, H through, H1 through 4. So if your traffic had a pattern where you know, there's a very heavy flow from H3 to H1, uh, but you know, not so heavy flow from other uh, nodes in the network to H1, you want to selectively take um, just the, the heavy flow and then reroute that to H2. And you want to do this in a completely location uh, agnostic manner. So if you had a, a large layer two domain, uh, possibly spanning multiple data centers, you still want to be able to do this sort of thing where a flow is diverted to a security device for further inspection. And so uh, uh, we, we have some of the elements of this working uh, in our lab. And uh, the idea here is that once the detection is done using you know, uh, stats, by, by looking at all the stats, we would configure affinity rules that would redirect the particular flows to the security appliance. So today we're doing everything using OpenFlow um, because our implementation today for the Affinity Engine is that it computes these Affinity paths and then uses OpenFlow as the method of you know, actually implementing those flows, that flow state. Um, so this is all entirely OpenFlow based today. Um, but you could imagine sort of other you know, proprietary networks or other kinds of networks where you, know, you have um, additional mechanisms to do the same kind of API. Um, so the same API can be implemented in many different ways. Today's, you know, what we have in, in the open implementation is all open flow based. Okay. So a little bit about uh, future. So we've been hyper-focused on this controller-driven SDN uh, 
you know, scenario. And where we think uh, we will go next is sort of expanding the API and the implementation in, in new ways. And for us, the, the sort of the more general cloud scenario is very interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of activity around OpenStack and Neutron, where um, OpenStack is, and, and Neutron are emerging as sort of the, the, the dominant uh, control plane for uh, cloud networking. And today, a lot of the focus has been around, you know, the hypervisor uh, vSwitch and Linux bridging. So uh, most of the work there is, you know, how do you control and how do you implement policies that are useful for cloud applications and cloud users uh, within this, this hypervisor uh, context. And we want to sort of integrate Affinity API with that. And we want, from the point of view of the network administrator, for all of this to look like one uniform fabric. So you have the network in the middle, the, the hardware platform in the middle, you have hypervisor on the edge, and everything should be visible through a single API, which is the Affinity API. And if you look at Neutron today, there's uh, at least two large portions of it. There's configuration and, and there's policy. And uh, we think that the policy piece can be completely implemented on top of the Affinity API. And so there's some discussion that you know, is, is going on right now uh, for post-hydrogen uh, development where we, we would like to sort of build this as an extension to the Affinity API. And the problem there is that uh, you know, cloud users come up and they launch their UI and they bring online these connectivity groups. So you have groups of, you know, uh, compute nodes and the expectation, the security policy is that things within uh, the, the C group must talk to each other and things outside of the C group don't have visibility and so they cannot talk to each other. And so the challenge for, for the network control is how do you establish the right, you know, forwarding state in the network that uh, you know, correctly implements that policy. Um, so provide visibility only within, within the C group and not outside. And how do you do that in a scalable way? Um, so that as your cluster gets very large, as, your, as the number of endpoints grows very large, you know, you're still, um, this is all still feasible and, and uh, occurring relatively fast. So uh, that's, that's the connectivity group problem. and. Um, uh, the uh, additional refinement is that um, you know we've largely been focused on layer two, layer three constructs. So uh, addresses uh, that are IP addresses or, or layer two MAC addresses. But um, once you're in the open stack world, you know a lot of the descriptions start to become more like firewall rules, where you know they want to block specific port numbers of TCP ports, and um, uh, you know other kinds of more, more deep uh, packet information. And so uh, ex expanding the Affinity API to sort of include that sort of uh, uh, descriptor is, is important. And so there is an application policy proposal that's out. And uh, I believe the latest on that is that it's, it's going to be in active development soon, so post-hydrogen. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude and see if there are other questions. So we don't have anything there. Um, uh, at least not at the moment. Uh, the question is, do we have a proposal for doing the traffic engineering implementation with an open daylight? And, and the answer is, Today we've done the exception cases, so uh, waypoint routing and TAP, and you know you can think of those as being sort of the exceptions to normal traffic engineering routing. And and we don't have we don't have anything currently planned around traffic engineering, but you know I think that might change. What does So we, we should talk a little bit offline because we certainly don't have anything uh, planned in that area. Okay. All right. 
Great. Thank you.